Um, yeah, so I'm, I think I'm doing two of these today, and one of them's sort of the business side, and this one is really more the like writing, writing side. Um, I, it might help if I start, like just a couple of questions. People, what, what are people really kind of interested in that is information I might be able to give you that you're here to hear? Just uh, anybody. Yeah, okay, good, good question. Um, anybody else? When I graduate, how would I make friends with everybody? Ooh, good luck. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Yes? Um, if you were to start all over again, what are some things you would do differently from writing the book that you would do differently? Okay, cool. Wait, 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 could you repeat writing the story again? Okay, great. Okay, cool. Well, let me tell you how I started, sort of. Uh, and this is really just to kind of help to you guys to know where I'm coming from with all this advice and what I say. Uh, there is no right or wrong way to do anything in this business. So everything I say, take with a grain of salt. Uh, anybody who says there's only, this is the way to do it, and if you do it not my way, you'll never make it, is crazy because every writer in Hollywood has a very different way that they started and a very different method for how they work uh, and a very different way for their business and, and the way they write. So this is my own personal experience. Uh, so I hope it's helpful, but take it with a grain of salt. Um, so I started I, uh, um, from Middle Tennessee. Uh, I went to NYU on Pell Grants and loans that I just recently paid off. Um, I went to NYU, and while I was there, I wasn't studying writing. Uh, I was in a comedy group that somebody put up a flyer freshman year, uh, and the comedy group was the state. Uh, and we all formed together, and right after college, we got a job on MTV on a terrible show called You Wrote It, You Watch It, uh, which Jon Stewart hosted. Uh, and the theme of the show was people would write in true stories. What was your worst date? You know, what's your scariest nightmare? And a group of actors would reenact them for, uh, for MTV. And the state, my comedy group, said, we have a better idea. What if we go out with a video camera and interview people so that you can cut together interview with the sketches and it might make it flow better? And they said, no, we don't want you to do that. Who are you kids? Um, we had all, while we were in this comedy troupe, there were 11 of us, and I'll, I'll talk business for a second. We all interned everywhere so that we might possibly get our foot in the door somewhere. So we interned, one of us interned at Ha, which became Comedy Central, it was first called Ha. One of us interned at Saturday Night Live, uh, one of us was at MTV, one of us was at Letterman. Like we literally, all of us worked for free just to ask people, come see our group, come see our group, come see our group, come see our group. Uh, nobody ever did. Um, but, <laughs> but one of us, the guy, David Wayne, was the intern at MTV. And he was there in the room and was able to corner one of the producers of You Wrote It, You Watch It and say, hey, we'll film interviews and do sketches that way for You Wrote It, You Watch It. They said no. So we went out and did it for free. Uh, we went out and filmed interviews in Times Square and we did three and we produced them ourselves. Uh, David uh, borrowed a camera from NYU. Uh, Joe borrowed sound equipment. I stole costumes. Um, but, and and we, we reenacted three little shorts. Uh, and we turned them in, and they found out how cheaply we had done it, and they hired us. Uh, at MTV, we made $297 a week. On uh, unemployment, we made $300. So we made more money on unemployment between series than we made while we were working. Um, and so we did that. Uh, that led to our, that show got canceled in a year. That led to The State, uh, which ran for three seasons. Uh, the State broke up, and then I started doing Viva Variety, which was a Comedy Central show. The third season of Viva Variety brought me to Los Angeles. And uh, we did all that before in New York. And in Los Angeles, we moved out there to get guest stars. And in Los Angeles, they love hiring people who are already working. 
They don't like hiring you if you're unemployed or if you haven't done anything yet. Like they say, what are you doing now? And if you say, oh, I'm a you know barista, then you're they're probably that's going to end the conversation. But uh, we were in a third season of a Comedy Central show, uh, so that I got a job as a screenwriter. I, somebody asked me to go in and pitch with my writing partner and another guy. Uh, material based on a book. Somebody had the rights to a book called You Are Going to Prison, um, written by a Unabomber type of a guy. It was like an 87-page book, and he'd written two books. One was How to Make Heroin, and one was You Are Going to Prison. And You Are Going to Prison was everything from when the cops knock on your door to the electric chair, this is everything that will happen to you. Um, and it was why to, you know, you should wear two sets of handcuff keys on your neck at all times because federal and local all use the same set of handcuffs. Uh, this is why to, this is how to make, uh, how to make wine in your toilet. You know, it was like every single thing that, that you could do. And so we went and pitched how to make it into a movie, uh, and that started us in the movie business. Um, and I'll talk about that way later. Since then, I do basic cable. Uh, Reno 911, it, it was our last one. We're doing a new pilot now that's a lot of the same Reno guys, which is why I have a shaved head and my eyebrows are dyed. Um, I had a white beard up until Friday, uh, which I, uh, I'm a robot. It's Reno 911 in space. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so I do basic cable for fun. Uh, for a living, I write screenplays. Um, and I write screenplays for the studio system. I, any bit of advice I give you, I've never done an indie. I've never done anything that's been nominated for any award. Um, I, I work for the studio. Uh, and I, I've done Disney movies like The Pacifier and a lot of, a lot of business at Fox with uh, um, Rebound, is I think the first one I started there in. Uh, and then these Night at the Museum movies. So the advice I'm giving you is not how to make an indie. It's not how to make a movie that's going to get awards. It's screenwriting 101 for the studio system, which is a very specific beast. Um, so that's where this is coming from. So if, if you say, well, you know, Chunking Express wasn't structured like that, you're right. Uh, and there's no way that any Hollywood studio would greenlight Chunking Express. Um, so what's a screenplay? A screenplay is a very, very specific form of writing. It's uh, 90 pages to about 110, usually. Uh, can it be longer? Sure, but uh, page count, the longer it is, the more expensive it is. Uh, most movies, people figure it's about a, a million a page. Uh, the kind of movies I write are about a million a page. So I've, I've turned in movies and literally the executive weighs it to see if it's about the right weight. Uh, so 100, 110. Gets much longer than 110, you start to scare people that you don't know what you're doing. Um, very specific format. Uh, I'm sure that you guys are learning all this stuff. Uh, Final Draft is what everybody I know uses. Final Draft is a program that you can buy that does everything for you. Um, very, very simple, and it makes your script look very, very professional. Uh, after you get started in a business, every studio has its own very specific format that they require you to use. When you work at Warner Brothers, you have to sign a contract that yours will be in Warner Brothers format. Uh, that means that it's the certain amount of length at the top and bottom of the page, the margins are a certain amount. So every studio is, is very specific, but none of that's secret. And if you get a final draft, it'll tell you exactly what to do. Um, but about 100 pages, and I think when you start in the business, when you start writing a screenplay, I know that when I wrote my first one, I was thinking, oh my god, 100 is a lot of pages to fill with stuff. After you get good at it, after you figure out structure, you'll realize that 100 pages is not a lot at all with how much you have to get in there. 100 pages is real, real quick to introduce character and get a good movie and get it going. 100 pages is you have to learn how to fit everything you want into a 100 pages, and that's hard. How do you write a screenplay? Any questions so far? How do you write a screenplay? OK. Good movies are really good characters and a really good story. Uh, same as anything that you're going to write, novels, anything. Really good characters and a really good story. How do you write a good character? Mm -hmm. um, Usually there's somebody who you really like. It's a likable guy, likable woman. Uh, usually in Hollywood movies, there's a, a great amount of wish fulfillment. 
uh, everybody wishes that we're, we're Batman or Zorro or Neo or Rick from Casablanca. Like there, there's, you, know, you make your main person somebody who's really, really, you want to be. I, I always make my, I don't, and what I do, this is, accidentally, this is actually good advice. Uh, don't, don't try to put your head into somebody else's head and guess who, what they want. Do it for yourself. Don't, don't try to think, well, what do kids like these days? Because then you're going to write something that's crap. Like, like, write it for yourself. Write a character who you wish you were. Um, I'm very lucky because I'm a 14-year-old boy inside. Uh, and I like dinosaurs and explosions and boobs, so I do all right in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> So, so write it. Write a character who's your main character, who who is is very very likable. Um, you know, don't make him super complicated. And that's when we get to structure that I'll talk about in a second. How do you do good character? Somebody likable, who the audience wants to be. That's your main character. How do you write a good story? Hmm. I don't know. You know, who who knows? Uh, Weirdo kid gets his friend Pedro elected to city council. Great. Uh, computer programmer finds out that he lives in a universe that's a computer and he is the messiah of all the people who live in this universe. Great. <laughs> you know, like, like there's no right, you know, there, there's no right way of writing a story and there's no wrong way of writing a story. And any, anybody who tells you this is the secret is full of it. Um, who knows what the good story is? You know, I, I always try to think of a story that, that I enjoy thinking up. Uh, and then as you structure it out, you figure out where it's got problems and you sculpt it in the right direction. But good story? Who knows? Uh, how to write good story and character? Nobody can teach you either of those things. Read good books. Uh, see good movies. Uh, live, travel, meet interesting people and talk to them, meet boring people and talk to them. Uh, go out, live, and, and that'll cultivate your imagination. But that's it, there's no secret to any of that stuff. Nobody can teach you that. But what people can teach is structure. Structure, 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 structure. Structure is your friend. Like I took a class, uh, one screenwriting class in college, and the whole time I was sitting there thinking, that's ridiculous. You can't distill art to such a simple system. Yes, you can. Uh, you, you, you can't distill movies. Yeah, but I like William Friedkin movies, and his exposition is 100 pages. True, uh, but his first movie was Pink Panther, and the exposition in that is 10 pages. Oh, look, Inspector Clouseau is an idiot, and a jewel got stolen. Here we go. Uh, he got to write Sorcerer and Exorcist way later, after he was very, very, very successful. Structure is your friend. Um, any good... Any great movie fits in the exact same structure, and I don't care if it's Casablanca or The Matrix or Die Hard or anything in between. All Hollywood movies are the same. It is a, uh, it's a blueprint. It's, it's a, the four walls of your house and the roof. Structure, 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 structure. Um, I, I tried to resist it, and by the time I'd written my fourth screenplay, I realized it's much, much easier if you introduce your character in the first 10 pages and then give your inciting incident and then get him into the adventure on page 25. All that stuff that's in all of the books is there because it's true. What is screenplay structure? Screenplays have three acts. Uh, you get a guy that you like up a tree, you throw rocks at him, you get him down out of the tree. Uh, aliens arrive on Earth, they kick our ass, we kick their ass. Uh, it, it, they're all they're all that. Um, now, beyond that broad structure, and that's and that's that's Casablanca, that's Matrix, that's Die Hard, that's everything. Beyond that, there's very specific other structure, and it's in all of the books. And I'll I'll just try to talk about them the way that I understand them, which is for your first ten pages, you're introducing everything that the audience needs to know in this whole movie. Uh, you're introducing your characters. You're introducing, if it's the Matrix, you're introducing the world. Uh, you're introducing, okay, this isn't quite Earth because the people in the suits with the earpieces talk kind of funny, and Trinity can run up walls, but it's not not Earth. Where are we? Like, the, and, and the Matrix, look at the Matrix. Uh, one thing I always do is I pick a movie that I like, and I watch it in uh, the DVD player, and I look at the time clock and see when stuff happens. Uh, and I go, yep, okay, page 10. We're, that's exactly what should happen on page 10. On page 10 of The Matrix, he runs into Trinity. He follows the white rabbit, and he meets Trinity in the bar. And Trinity tells him, there's a bigger world out there. Do you ask yourself, what is The Matrix? 
That's your first 10 pages. You've introduced everybody, you've introduced all your character, and then something happens. Uh, in Casablanca, the letters of transit come in to, the, to, to Rick's cafe. The letters of transit, which the whole movie's about those two letters of transit that can get somebody out of Casablanca. And those first 10 pages, you meet Rick, you meet Casablanca, you find out that we're in this world, that everybody's fleeing the Nazis, and there's no way out of this city. And then on page 10, uh-oh, there's two ways out of this city, these two letters of transit. Um, how to do exposition in those 10 pages is if you master that, you have a very good leg up on people. Um, Die Hard is a genius with its setup. Like the first 10 pages of Die Hard, it's, it's every single word is something that's super important for later. Uh, his shooter off, you know, you, he's got to rub his, his toes in the carpet, and so that's why his shoes are off later in the movie. Like when they meet Mr. Nakatomi for Nakatomi Plaza, like every single thing he says is super important. Yeah, we have three levels that are unfinished. Yeah, the computers have bugs. Yeah, you know, like every, every word that he says is very important to the rest. Uh, same with Matrix. The, Great way that they do exposition in uh, Casablanca, which is fun to steal for your movie, is they tell you that Rick is cool. They don't show him at all, but every single person you meet says, ah, Rick owns the place. He's super cool. I'm trying to buy his cafe. Uh, you know, oh, women throw themselves at him. Rick, where were you last night? Like, and, and so he, by the time you've heard about Rick so much that when you see him on about page eight, all he has to do is go, he, that's it. He doesn't talk. It's, it's masterful. So learn to have fun with how to set up your movie. Um, if it takes more than 10 pages to explain everything that you need to explain, you're doing it wrong. Um, you're not doing a studio movie. Um, I, I'm a very big fan of William Friedkin movies. Um, the Exorcist, nothing happens in The Exorcist for the first hour. And I love it. Like, like, like the first hour, you're, you're seeing them filming a movie there in, in Georgetown, and the little girl's making art, and, like, and there's an hour before that demon takes over that girl, or even before there's a hint of it. It's great. Again, that wasn't his first screenplay. Like, he sold Shot in the Dark, Pink Panther, before that. Uh, he also wrote Sorcerer, great movie. Nothing happens in that movie for an hour and 40 minutes. Nothing. And, and uh, that movie's about a truck driving through the jungle, they get in that truck an hour, 45 minutes after the movie starts. It's great. Good luck selling it. Um, I've heard people, you know, I say that and you say, well, what about Avatar? Um, Avatar's three hours long, and, and who knows with that. First movie that he sold was Terminator. And in Terminator, that hits with the ground running. And that follows the old structure, the 100-page structure, perfectly. So first 10 pages, introduce everything. Page 10. The inciting incident happens. When people say inciting incident, it's very confusing. Um, I think. I, that doesn't really make sense. But do you guys know Joseph Campbell? Hands up, the Joseph Campbell stuff. Joseph Campbell uh, is like a sociologist who went around the world and found out that all great stories, you know, Africa, Japan, America, Europe, they're all the same story. It's all, it's all Luke Skywalker. Every single story is Luke Skywalker. Um, and what he calls the inciting incident is the call to adventure, which makes much more sense to me. Call to adventure is Trinity saying to Neo, you want to know what's out there, don't you? Do you wake up and ask yourself, what is the Matrix? He doesn't go. He goes back to work. Neo goes back to work the next day. Uh, Luke Skywalker sees, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm your only hope. He does not rush off and save her. He's got to stay on the farm. The crops are coming in next year. Like, he, he is staying here. He doesn't go right away. Um, so, call to adventure happens. You get invited. And then we learn more and more reasons why our hero probably should be involved. We learn that his father uh, was killed by Darth Vader, which we later learn is super cool because he is Darth Vader. And then it gets really uncool because they made three new movies and it really screwed it up. Um, but but he, you learn more and more that start to pull your main character into the adventure. Uh, Neo from The Matrix goes back to work the next day 
and gets a phone call that doesn't make any sense. And they tell him, duck, run, go out this way. But he's not ready for the adventure yet. They tell him to jump out the window and grab onto the rope. He does not do it yet. Luke Skywalker does not go. Luke Skywalker stays. Uh, they even take away Neo's mouth, and he still doesn't want to go. He still looks down that dark road in the rainy street and doesn't want to go. He goes on page 25. On page 25 is when he takes the red pill. On page 25 is when stormtroopers terror kill Aunt Uncle Owen and Aunt Veru, and he goes and he sees the burnt corpses and all the burnt Jawas, and he says, there's nothing for me here, let's go. He goes, that's page 25. So when you write your movie, introduce people for 10 pages, get them a little bit thicker in the stew for a little bit, and then on page 25, they go. That's when Larry Daly takes the job at the museum, is, is on page 25. Uh, and I'm not comparing it to Casablanca or Matrix, <laughs> because it's better. Uh, um, so so that's, that's it. Now, now on page, the, then in great movies like King Kong, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Like really, really good ones, like poor Bruce Willis in the Nakatomi Plaza. Like, like he, gets, he, he gets the leg up on everybody, but he just gets beaten up and thrown around. Make it as hard for your main character as you can. Again, I'm not talking about Chungking Express here. I'm talking about multiplex movies. Um, page 45, whatever you thought was going to happen, make it worse. Uh, whatever, whatever you thought you were aiming towards, make it worse. On page 45, you've been building poor Keanu Reeves up that he was the one. And all this pressure is on his shoulders that he is the one. He's got he's to save the universe. And on page 45, the Orpheus tells him, or the Oracle tells him, you're sorry. Sorry, kid. You're not the one. And so now it's even worse for him because now he's not going to get the girl. He's not going to be able to save his planet. And nobody will even believe him that he's not the one. Uh, it's great. That's when, uh, that's when our, our poor Rick in Casablanca finds out that the guy also in love with his girlfriend is the greatest guy in the world, is, is Hans Conry. It's beautiful. Uh, it, like, that's when you make things a little bit worse for everybody. Keep going. You get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. I'm just trying to find all my examples because I'm trying to think of... You can do this with any good movie. Page 75, the new rug that you have put underneath Neo, yank that one out from number in two. Like, like make it even worse. That, that's when uh, Morpheus gets kidnapped. That's when, uh, that's when King Kong... That's when... Uh, that's when uh, King Kong gets loose in New York City. Like, uh, you know, like, like whatever you thought you were building towards, it's much, much worse than you think it is. Like, and that, that's like your main horrible, horrible low is really page, page, page 75. That's, what, what that is is in the three-act structure, that's what launches you into act three. So you have act one, you've met Neo, he's gone on this adventure. Act two, you've thrown rocks at him, he's, he's training, he's doing all stuff that's super fun. He's learning Kung Fu, and we learn that the agents are completely unbeatable, and every time he tries to beat him, he fails. At the end of that, your act three is the worst possible thing that could happen does, which is they capture Morpheus. And this is what they call the act three engine. Um, and boy, all, all studios are going to say, you know what, I'm worried, there's not an engine in driving Act 3. The engine is literally, there is something you need to get in a time clock that's trying to stop you. And if you don't get the thing that you're trying to get before that time clock, all is lost. So Hans Gruber has got the detonators again. He, like on, on the end of Act 3, right, end of Act 2, he steals the detonators back from Bruce Willis. Uh, they have stolen Morpheus. And so there are big Scary aliens drilling their way towards you, and they're going to eat all of us, and they're going to kill Morpheus. So Neo has to save Morpheus before this thing drills down to the ship. Uh, Bruce Willis has to stop the plan before they blow up the top of the Nakatomi Plaza. Things that blowing up help. Um, in pitching, uh, uh, Terry Gilliam, uh, I went to a thing with Terry Gilliam spoke, and he says, yeah, explosions, and when you pitch, move your hands a lot, because it makes it, people think something's happening. Um, that engine, what, what, uh, what 
Alfred Hitchcock called that was the MacGuffin. Uh, he called it the MacGuffin, and that, and it doesn't matter what it is. He said it's a time bomb. It's the Ark of the Covenant. You know, <laughs> like it's something that our hero has to get before the bad guy does the thing that he's going to do. Um, that's your Act Three, and that's your page seventy-five point. Uh, page ninety is your you're rocking towards the end. James Bond has made it into Fort Knox, and he has no idea how to defuse the time bomb. And odd job is throwing a hat at him. Like uh, that, that's you're you're there. You're at you're at the mission of the movie, and obstacles are worse than they've ever been. That's when uh, Neo. Everybody else get he saves Orpheus. Morpheus got him. Everybody Trinity and everybody gets zapped back to the spaceship, and he's here alone. And the phone gets shot out from under him, and he has to fight Agent Smith which is something that this entire movie, everybody has said, you cannot do. Um, you can't fight an agent. Uh, this is uh, literally in Casablanca, the plane has come. The Nazi, it's when, ha it's when uh, Claude Rains, everybody seen Casablanca? See it, the perfect, perfect structure, the perfect movie. Uh, it, it's so good. But that's when Claude Rains actually does something clever and gets the drop on him and calls the Nazi instead of the airport. And so the Nazis are on the way. And for the first time in the movie, Bogart is caught by surprise. Boom. So that's your last 10 pages. Make them good. This is where every, all of the work that you've done, creating all of these wonderful characters, this great bomb that you can't defuse, odd job, a great villain, you know, Agent Smith, you make him badass. And literally, you've been training uh, Keanu Reeves the whole movie for this fight. And yet, this is the first time he's fought any of these guys. So this last 10 pages is when you pull out all the stops. Um, in Land of the Museum, it was a uh, stagecoach ride through Central Park that was supposed to have cowboys and Indians chasing them. That got scaled back. <laughs> um, that's your end. And then page 10, he wins. He is the one. Page 10, uh, that's, that's when uh, he, he, it's easy. Like you get to the end and you make that end so cool that all Luke Skywalker has to do is use the force. Boom, easy peasy. You know, Neo fights Agent Smith and it's simple. You make that end super, 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 super great and fun and pay off everything. Uh, your hero is somebody who at the beginning of the movie you kind of wish you are because Keanu Reeves is kind of cool. People should leave the theater thinking, oh my God, I'm going to go see that again and buy the Halloween costume. Like that's, that's your multiplex movie. And I wonder what's going to happen in the sequel. Usually they suck. Uh, and then the last few pages, that's when uh, James Bond has sex with a beautiful broad on a raft. You know, like, like you see, just kind of end it with uh, something kind of fun and interesting. Hint to a sequel. But those, those last fun moments are giving, it's a few pages where the audience gets to enjoy the success with their character. You know, uh, Star Wars, they all, they all get medals, you know, great, whatever. Um, but, but, but like that last minute, and so that's your movie. And, and like, when you see all that needs to happen in your film, I mean, your main character also has to have people around him who are interesting. Uh, in really like a Star Wars and the Matrix, it's really, and, and like Batman, you know, it's really great to have movies where he has an old wise trainer. Yeah, that's, that's somebody who teaches him the world and teaching, teaches him the movie, which if you're doing something like science fiction or fantasy, that really helps because you have a character, create a main character who doesn't know what the Matrix is so that somebody else can just explain to him and the audience at home every single thing that's happening in this weird, interesting world. When you're doing sci-fi, like, it's structure, like, this is, in comedies, people always ask, studio always always ask, well, who's the end point? Who's the end point? And in comedies, that means, who is the guy in the movie who the audience is kind of like? Who is Pinto and Flounder in Animal House? Like, you can't do a movie that's all just Animal House, where everybody's berserk and pouring mustard on themselves. You need, you need somebody to come in the movie that is the end point for the audience, who the audience is like, oh, I'm that guy, and look, he's fallen in with all these great guys, and by the end of the movie, he's the best of the great guys. You know, that's Neo. Like, Neo, at the beginning, is as clueless as the audience at home. And boy, in science fiction, where the world is incredibly complicated, or when you're trying to turn somebody into Batman, it's great when you have an Obi-Wan Kenobi there who can literally explain every single thing to that guy. Um, if you write comedies, 
comedy structure changes in Hollywood, not structure, uh, comedy, the, what, what people are looking for in comedies that they sell changes every few years. Um, a few years ago in Hollywood, it was big movie star comedies. They wanted Jim Carrey and Will Ferrell or, or like one guy. And that one guy is crazy. And everybody else goes, whoa, that guy's crazy. Um, now, uh, I think it's, we're in a slightly better phase. Like now it's more ensemble stuff. Now with like the Judd Apatow movies, like it's really about one sort of normal guy and Zach Galifianakis and Ed Helms, you know, like, and, and you know, you put those, those people around him. But it's always a main character. Uh, yeah, the, you're, this is when I was in those seats, I said, ugh, but I don't like movies like that. Have a main character, wise guy teaching him is good, love, all good movies are about love. Like, like a, every single movie, and, and I, as a writer myself in comedy, it always, you know, you think, yeah, but that's so much legwork you gotta give to some romance, and who cares? Uh, but, you know, Ghostbusters, it's really about Sigourney Weaver, and like Buster Keaton movies, it's always about the girl. Like his motivation is always about the girl. Like the reason that Bill Murray becomes a hero in that movie is because Sigourney Weaver turns into a dog. You know, and the reason really that, uh, that Neo becomes Neo really is because he's in love with Trinity. Love. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. So, so like, I can't tell you how to fill the world with interesting characters. That's your job and nobody can teach you that. I can't tell you what the world is. You know, I think that the kids today are so much savvier than I was. Like, it, like I had to watch, when I was 10, uh, we got a VCR, and we were like the first people in Murfreesboro. Like, uh, so you couldn't just watch movies over and over and over and over, like the way that kids can now. Uh, when I was working, my first job in cable, we had to edit on a Steinbeck, which was, you don't even know, which is you would tape it, and literally, you had these machines that went and you'd get it to the part that you wanted to, and you would cut it and tape it together. That was TV! That was TV, like in 1992. Like, you edited tape. Like, now, the editing stuff that you guys have on your laptops advances anything that in television up until 20 years ago. So, you guys can do anything you want. So, what the world is going to be for you guys, what worlds you create is going to be fantastic and fascinating. And it may be westerns again, or pirate movies, or it may be something that you guys are going to bring into the world. So I can't tell you how to do that. Stick to this structure, though. No, stick to this structure. You surprise people. Oh my God! Uh, so, uh, th this uh, Pixar, who, who I think are the, the, I think they're the most brilliant studio today, it, like hands down. <clears throat> A friend of mine, uh, Patton Oswalt, did Ratatouille, um, and they gave him these story cards, and they're literally they're like the Glenn Gary Glenn Ross leads. They're like these beautiful, like they're these cards, and they're they're flash cards for has your movie done this, and one of them is when you get to a point in the movie where, you ex where the audience expects one thing to happen, turn it the other way. Don't, don't do, have your lead character react in a way that you don't expect him to. Uh, Woody, like Woody, Woody, okay, Woody, you set him up as the greatest guy in the world, Woody. All, everybody loves him, and the plot point in that movie is jealousy. He hates Buzz Lightyear. Like, like they, you know, they, they do think, create a great character, and when you get to those points, King Kong had it easy because it was the first one, <laughs> but, but like, when you get to those points, don't do the first thing that you think of. Surprise people, you know? Like, like when Neo takes the jump off the roof, he falls. Uh, you know, like, like surprise people. And the, I think the best way to surprise people is character, is to reveal something interesting about your character. It's hard. Uh, you know, like, like keeping it, and the difference between Die Hard and the other hundred other movies that are Die Hard in a boat, and it's Die Hard in a, in a jacuzzi, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, you know, the, you know, the difference between the good one and the bad one is everything. And, and, you know, people, you know, like, complain, rightly so, you know, that most Hollywood studio movies suck. They do. Because uh, it's committee thinking, there's a hundred reasons that they suck. Um, but they've always sucked. You know, like, when you look back, like, like, the year that Casablanca came out, Warner Brothers made 140 movies. 
where are the other ones? You know, like, they sucked. You know, like, uh, you know, like, and, uh, you know, 39 was such a great year because, like, uh, Robin Hood and Gone with the Wind and Stagecoach, you know, like, it was this weird, incredible year where Mavericks were working in Hollywood. Most years, 99% of the movies that come out of the studio system suck. Most indies suck. You know, the, one, the indies that have, have risen to that you've heard of them are the cream of the crop. And there's another 95% of them that suck. Like the, the, the luck of a good movie coming together with a script, with a script that doesn't get screwed up in, in the process, in the development process, with a cast that comes together that likes the director. I go to a movie, and if a movie's good, it's a miracle. Or it's Pixar, you know, like, and, 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 and Pixar movies, they, they control everything. It's not a bunch of people sitting around. It's, it's John Lasseter and Brad Bird, and they go, yes, no, yes. And they write it themselves, and they control everything. They plan everything a year in advance. How am I doing on time? Do I have uh, five minutes? That's it? Oh, geez. I have so many. Good... I have seven minutes? I thought it was till 3.30. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, I'll say this. Outlines are your friend as a writer. Um, write outlines. Uh, I write outlines. My outlines are usually about 25 pages. Uh, they, uh, it'll take me about four weeks to write an outline and about two weeks to write the movie. Um, that's not exaggerating. Like uh, In your outline, it helps you figure out every single thing that happens in the movie. Make it so specific. I write mine with everything except dialogue. Everything except dialogue. So that when I sit there like, and make it 25 pages, so that when something doesn't work, you haven't written 60 pages of screenplay. You've only written 15 pages of an outline. And you can figure it out. Use the outline to figure it out. And then when you have a perfect outline, you get to the screenplay, and you go, OK, they walk into a bar. And you don't have to guess what happens. You know exactly what happens. You know everything except for the dialogue. Uh, you know, OK, they walk in the bar. And in this bar, they have to get a fight. And the main guy has to go out the window. Easy peasy, easy peasy. So write outlines and be super hard on your outlines. And that will make writing your screenplay totally fun. Do the hard part in a screenplay. If you have a partner, if you have a writing partner, write the outline. This is, again, grain of salt. Write the outline together so that the two of you figure out the big parts of what your movie is, and like that's when you argue. Uh, my writing partner, Tom, and I usually do this in bars. Um, and you figure out the movie like that. And then, <coughs> when you're writing the screenplay, divide it into sections. Um, I'll do page one, you do page two, I'll do page three. You, you figure out a good little beginning, middle, and end. <clears throat> then I'll write the first part while he's writing the second. I email him mine, he connects it. I go and read part one and part two, see how that affects my next part, rewrite it a little bit as I go and add my next section. He does the same, adds his part, rewrites a little bit as he goes and adds that next section. By the time we're at the end, it's a 50th draft. By the time it's at the end, we've rewritten it and rewritten it and rewritten it and rewritten it and rewritten it. So by the time it says the end, it's pretty damn good. Like, and we've both gone over it uh, time and time again. Like, uh, with the way that we write, we never argue about anything. Um, ever. Um, we write it, and if I don't like his joke, I cut it. Uh, and if he doesn't like my joke, I cut it. And if somebody puts their joke back in, you cut it again. The third time, all right, fine, they love it. You keep it in there. But, but we, we never argue. You do it all on paper. Um, what was your question? How do you make money starting? Um, whew, do anything you can. I wash dishes. <laughs> like, uh, do anything you can. And in television, depending on what you want to do, a really good way to come up in television is to be an assistant, is to be writing assistant, especially in like, like uh, well, in, in any world. Like our, our current, one of the producers on this pilot I just did started as, as our assistant. Um, but take any work you can get, and like, like PA, production assistant, like, like go in and intern for a company. Anything that you can get to be around people, do like especially we can get show that you're not an idiot and that you're smart. That's a real good in. Like uh, it, it, the system isn't like it used to be, where it used to before the internet. It was almost impossible to get your script to somebody who could make a decision. That's not true anymore because I mean I know people who have had meetings with studios based on something funny they did for Funny or Die. You know, and they do something really funny, and people go, wow, who's that kid? And they, they bring them up. So the barriers aren't as high as they used to be. But any, any job that you can get, get. 
uh, don't, be, don't be snooty. And like the other thing about writing, the, the secret to writing, here are well, well, two quick things since I don't have that much time. Uh, if you're writing a character, write it for a movie star. Um, like don't, don't be esoteric about it. Like uh, the only way that movies get greenlit is if a movie star wants to do it. Um, so when I'm writing a movie, I think when I started, I would think, well, this is kind of, kind of Peter Lorre is this guy, and then this guy is kind of like my uncle. Um, and, and that would be the voice in my head that I would use to write it. Write it for Ben Stiller. Write it for Russell Crowe. Write it for The Rock. You know, write, write it for somebody who they have a cadence in their head. Ben Stiller has a cadence. Yeah, no, I mean, wait, what did you say? He has a cadence. And, and, and if, you, if you are thinking that cadence, you can write for him. And if, even if he doesn't do it, write it so that a studio sees it and thinks, okay, this, this, the lead of this is a 700-pound Australian guy with one arm. Like, how do you cast that? You know, you know the, the, the lead of this is, you know, a, a, it just ran into a pickle. There aren't that many A-type American actors anymore. There aren't that many, like Harrison Ford was kind of the last one. Now they're all Australian. Like, you have to, you have to write, write a movie that a movie star would like to do. Um, don't write that he's ugly. Don't write that he's a loser. Uh, mistakes that I did in the past. Like, uh, you know, a loser with the heart of gold. Movie stars don't want to be that. Movie stars want to be handsome but disheveled. Uh, you know, like, like mo mo movie stars, they want to read it and think, oh, I like this guy. Uh, So-and-so's mother, uh, gorgeous but harried. You know, like, like, like write it for a movie star. Unless it's an experiment that you're doing, write it for a movie star because it won't get greenlit unless a movie star wants to do it. Uh, and rewrite. Rewrite, 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 rewrite. Um, it's so... You will never be good at writing by thinking about it. Uh, you'll never be good at writing talking about it. You'll only be good at writing if you write. Write all the time. Write all the time. And write, finish it. Finish your screenplay. Even if your first draft is terrible, finish it. And then go back and rewrite it. Um, what I do is I, I write it, and then I pick it up, and I pretend some other, uh, some other asshole wrote it. I, I, you know, Because I do a lot of rewrite work. Um, in Hollywood, it's a good business to be in. Um, I pick it up as though somebody else wrote it, and I attack it. And by the time I've written a draft that I turn into the studio, no, not a single word will be left from the very first draft that says the end. But write it, because getting to the end is hard. And after you get to the end, rewriting it is easy, because then you kind of know the mistakes that you've made. You know that you can cut a bunch of stuff. It's probably too long. You see when a character does something that's illogical. But until you get to the end, you can sit and stew about, oh, what's page 47 going to be forever? Write it. Write it to the end. And write, if you're going to be a writer, write all the time. Um, Try this experiment. If you think you're the greatest screenwriter in the world, write a screenplay. Polish it. Make it perfect. Set it aside. Write a second screenplay. Polish it. Make it perfect, where not a single word could be better. Set it aside. Write a third screenplay. And you need specs anyway, and I'll talk about this in the next one, in the business one. Write a third screenplay. Polish it. Make it the greatest screenplay ever written. Now, put up, pick up your first screenplay and read it. It'll suck. You'll, you'll, you'll read it and you'll think, oh my God, you, you will have learned so much in writing screenplays that you never would have learned thinking about it or talking about it. You'll look at your first screenplay and be embarrassed. But if the idea was good, you'll rewrite it and make it great. Write all the time. Write manically. Uh, it's like anything, exercise, craftsmanship, anything. You can only be good at it if you do it all the time for years and years and years and years and years. And if you're born with the gift, you'll get better. You'll get better and better and better and better. Um, I think I have like five minutes for questions, maybe. Questions? I did good. Nobody has any. <laughs> uh, you talked about doing rewriting work and stuff in Hollywood, and if somebody else wrote it, then they send it to you if it doesn't work. Uh, as a screenwriter, when that happens to you, how do you kind of disconnect yourself? Or you, you have to. You, you have to. You know, screenwriters in Hollywood, you're one below doormat. Like, you have to just accept that you're not writing novels. Um, and, and it's part of the system. You're not writing novels. If you want to write something that exists only for what it is on the page, write novels. Because if you write screenplays, 
the director is going to come in and change it, hopefully. Hopefully, if an interesting, good director, if Ridley Scott wants to do your screenplay, he likes some part of it, but he's going to rewrite it. Actors are going to kind of come in and like make it their own. Uh, development execs. The higher up you get, the more freedom you have. And it's also people respect your work more, and so they trust you more, and they don't let a lot of junior executives uh, change it. I pause every once in a while because I'm about to say profanity and they're taking me. Um, like, uh, but, they'll, but they'll change it. And so you just you need to accept that, that that'll happen. Um, I, there's, uh, writing, there's a pretty small circle of writers in Hollywood, and we rewrite each other all the time. Like I rewrite Zach Penn, and like John Hamburg rewrites us, and then I'll rewrite John Hamburg. You know, like, and I know them all, and we're pretty social, but like, it's, it's, that's Hollywood. Like you're, it's, you're a, a writer is one part in the puzzle. And you're not writing a screenplay to be brilliant and perfect. You're writing a screenplay to get made into a movie. And as you get more power, you can eventually produce and direct your own stuff. You know, one of the reasons that me and my partner do Basic Cable is because we have total freedom. Because we don't spend $100 million on it. Reno's budget is 600000 an episode. So, like, with that little money, we have more freedom. And in features, we're getting there. But, like, it takes time. But, yeah, it's don't be precious about your work. It's part of it. Uh, I think it's the same sense of humor. You know, uh, sketch is sketch. You know, sketch is, is two minutes, three minutes, so you can do whatever. Uh, but the, the sense of humor is the same. Like, uh, we've been doing stuff about slapping monkeys in everything we do, you know, whether it's a monkey slapping Ben Stiller or, you know, us slapping monkeys on the stage. You know, we've been, you know, we have a, it's the same sense of humor. Uh, but, you know, and, and you try to, it, you, sketch movies, become episodic, you know? Like, it's really hard to do a sketch movie, because even Holy Grail, which is the best one, like, it kind of lulls in the middle, because you don't care. But, you know, the, you know and, and if you've seen it, like, I think the first time you see Holy Grail, you're into it, because you think they might find the Holy Grail. And then the second time, you're like, you know, it, it wanders, because there's no point in it, because it's a sketch movie, which is great. Um, but if you also look at, like, comedies, they're, they're, they're very sketch-like. They're always, like, little set pieces, you know, like ours, there's the little cowboy set piece, and there's, you know, you, you know, you, the, the Octavius running across the White House lawn, is like, you think of them as kind of sets, but you just have to keep really good story characters kind of going through the whole thing. But yeah, you try to be as weird as you are in a sketch show in a movie, you know, that's, that's the goal, certainly. Yeah, well, that movie is all set up. Like, really good movies. I mean, that movie is like everything you hear in that movie is set up. But in the first 10 pages, until you meet Trinity, you, you really know everything you need to know about Neo. You know what I mean? Like, you, like it's a, it, there's a main kind of character that you really need to introduce. Yeah, that's, and, and like, when I say that you need to set up the whole world, that's just because that movie is so interesting. But the beginning lets you know you're not on Earth. You know, the beginning lets you know you have this main character who, suspects something's going on, and there obviously is something weird going on. But that's, yeah, the first 10 pages are about your main guy, yeah. <laughs> you tell me. Um, it's very, very different project to project. Um, sometimes it's the guy who bought the rights to a book, um, and, and they are in charge, and they don't do anything else. Some executive producers are involved in every single step of the way. It's very, very different. Um, you know, some executive producers are involved in casting, and they, they, they get a rights to a book, and they hire the writer, and the director, and the star, and they really do do everything. And then some executive producers, like Chris Columbus was an executive producer on Night at the Museum, and I never met him. Like, uh, and he was part of a partnership deal that worked with Sean Levy's company. So he got a credit and he got a lot of money and I never met the man. So it's it's different every time. So everything. We're 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 first to come in and last to leave. Like like um, me and Tom for Reno, everything. We we write it, we cast it, uh, we improv with our we when we audition, we improv with the people who are auditioning. We star in it, direct it, edit it, 
deal with we deal with the network, like we deal with promotion, like like it's it's we do everything. And the only reason that they let us do that is because it's so cheap. It's because it's so low budget that nobody cares, you know? Yeah. Yeah, one more. Can you get one? Yeah, I don't know anybody who's done that. I've heard of that. So I, I, I don't have uh, agency trained. I don't have any advice because I, I don't really know anybody who's done yeah, that. Really I've had the same agent for a long time. I was at William Morris. Uh, I didn't like William Morris, and so I left about 10 years ago to CAA. Um, I would say the, the best way, and I can talk about this more in the business thing next, but like, um, it used to be harder than it is. Now, use the internet. Use the internet. Put up a sketch if you're if you're do comedy, do a little sketch and produce it and put it on the internet. Uh, if it's a drama, read it. Do a stage reading. I know a lot of people who've gotten their agents through something on YouTube. Like it's it's a real. It, keep writing specs. Like write specs because when you get a meeting with an agent, they're going to say, "Great, what all have you? What what have, what else have you done?" And you're going to need a lot of work. They don't want to hire somebody who's just done one thing because they don't represent writing, they represent writers, so you need a lot of stuff. But I think the best way to get in today is getting a job as a PA or a production assistant or a writing assistant in Hollywood or getting something onto YouTube that's interesting and weird. I've got the buddy, I got a buddy who did that, uh, this guy, um, Mitch Silpa, who did a thing on YouTube where he imitates David Blaine, the magician. It's really funny. It's like this little three-minute thing, and it was free. It's like him and his buddy in an alley, and he's being David Blaine, and he's, you know, you know are these your Cheetos? And it's like this really stupid, like, thing. But he got, the, from that video, it got 15 million hits, and he got a meeting at Universal, and now he's writing the new draft of uh, Todd Phillips' movie, the fighting rock, knock em, suck em robots. Like, um, like, but he got representation from it. Like, like, he was a sketch comedy guy who, like, worked at UCB Theater, and, like, Get stuff out there produced. Like the, the the gates are open now with YouTube and Funny or Die and stuff like that. That that would be my best advice. Thank you guys. <laughs>